Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with an ancillary chat to my series of criticism masterclasses, How to Be Your Own Music Critic. Uh, some of the tricks of the trade that I've picked up over the past 40 some odd years that I've been doing this stuff. One of the things that I learned, um, and I just have to say this straight out from one of my mentors, the late, late, well, he's not late, he's still alive, thank goodness, the great Sedgwick Clark, who was the features editor for Musical America for like 30 years and who took over from Ted Libby at High Fidelity when I was writing there. Sedge used to say to me, there are two words you should never use in a review. One is unique because it's generic and it doesn't mean anything. Everything is unique from everything else. So what's the point, right? And the other is definitive because there is no such thing as a definitive performance of a classic. And he's right, of course. I mean, these are these are just the little tips you pick up along the way. And I'm enormously grateful to Sedge for imparting his wisdom to me when I was an up and coming critic. But as I've been reading reviews and writing reviews, I've noticed there are at least five five major sort of affectations that critics adopt when they want to either sound profound or have nothing to say, <laughs> but need to fill up space. You know, there's that wonderful old adage in advertising, if you have nothing to say, then sing it. <laughs> Come up with a song. You don't have anything else to do. Well, this is the sort of critical, music critical equivalent of that. And there are five of these critical affectations that I want to talk to you about and consider. Now, mind you, I want to say straight out, I am not saying that these things are always wrong or that or that you can't touch on them. The issue is not that. The issue is that they become the focus of the review. And if they are the main point of the review, then you have a pretty good sense that there's nothing that the reviewer has to say. Now, listen, I, 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 you have to offer a little twinge of sympathy for these folks. I'm one of them. Please have sympathy for me because we have to, we, we've all been on a deadline. We have to write things, things we don't want to talk about. We have to talk about them. I'm sure I'm guilty of committing these sins. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not infrequently. I don't know, but that's what they are. Um, and you should know about it. And that way it can inform your your shrewder, more selective view of the critical universe. So first, <clears throat> one group of people that just irritates the crap out of me, the intonation imbeciles. Intonation is like a big deal in music, right? You want to have good intonation, pointing out that you know, certain ensembles have fine intonation, especially things like string quartets, because string intonation is always sort of an iffy thing, um, or brass playing. These are important issues, and you want to note them when they matter. But there are there are people out there, particularly people who have experience with the instruments in question, who obsess about it, and it it's it's just annoying. I always pitied people who had perfect pitch. Oh, look at the alliteration there. Pity the people with perfect pitch because they can't enjoy anything. I'll, I'll never forget. I was listening to, uh, I, I was talking to our choral director and he had never heard Bruckner's Te Deum, believe it or not. Well, back in the, in the, in the seventies, Bruckner wasn't, especially in the U S you know, people didn't hear Bruckner. They didn't know his motets. And I had the Carion recording, the analog recording, which is fabulous of the Bruckner Te Deum with the Wiener Singverein or one of those groups singing along. I don't know, something like that. And, and we were listening to it and the assistant choral director who only lasted for like 10 minutes for reasons which i think are obvious uh, would become obvious uh was she claimed to have perfect pitch and we're listening to the final fugue at the end and we're enjoying it very much and she's sitting there like this with one hand over this ear so she could make an internal perfect pitch tone and compare it to the tones that were coming out of the speaker. And she's like, oh my God, that's flat, that's sharp, that's sharp, that's flat, that's flatter than flat, that's what... And I, I, you just wanted to like drop kick her out of the building. She was so annoying. 
And finally, our, our choral director said to her, just, just, just listen to the damn music. It's enough. You know, you don't have to show that you have better intonation than Herbert von Karajan and the, the Wiener Singverein or whatever they, whatever they were. I, it, it's all totally unnecessary. This came up actually recently in the comments section too, when we were talking about the Staatskapelle Dresden playing Bruckner and someone always yells about, oh, they're brass, their intonation is terrible. Well, no, it isn't. It may not be perfect, like a sine wave, <laughs> you know, but that doesn't mean it's bad. A lot of intonational color comes from, well, for example, vibrato, which is deliberate, imperfect intonation in some respects, you know, or from, you know, the, the, the color of the instruments or their, their school of playing, or uh, there are a million reasons why people have the intonational habits that they do. And this is particularly true in instruments which do not have fixed intonation, like a glockenspiel. You cannot change the intonation of a glockenspiel. It is what it is. Or, or an instrument that has, you know, that's very well keyed so that the intervals are extremely pre-established you know a lot of brass instruments and string instruments particularly which don't have frets on the on the fingerboard you have to learn how to find your intonation as you play and in different keys and in different circumstances and different musical contexts that intonation can be quite different now sour intonation bad intonation is of course something to be decried and mentioned when it happens but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people whose standard, usually undefined, is some alleged sphere of perfection that only they can hear <laughs> and nobody else can. And that's that's just a, a form of, of of elitism or snobbery or or I you know it's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. So that's that's one thing. I mean, there are moments in in you know works where passages of great hysteria pop up where a little bit of bad intonation can be very exciting. I mean, it, it, it lends the music a sense of tension, of going over the top, of losing control. Sometimes you may want a little of that as an artistic factor. There is that element to it as well. So, you know, it's like having a little bit of bitterness in a recipe, a little bit of, you know, heat and in, in, in something that calls for hot sauce. It's a little painful, but it's part of the it's part of the thrill. So the intonation imbeciles are one group. The next group, oh, the diction dodos. These are opera people, usually, or voice people. And they are some of the most obnoxious people you will ever encounter. They're always screaming about how singers have poor diction. It's like the people who say that I have poor pronunciation, quite frankly. I hate them just as much. That's why they get banned from my channel when they mention that stuff. You know, what matters is that you understand what they're saying or singing about um, one way or another, or that they are communicating musically the meaning of what they're singing about. How well they pronounce it? Well, everybody has an accent. Everybody. Everyone in the universe. There is no one rule for perfect diction. I mean, people jump on Joan Sutherland because she had very mushy consonants quite often. And sometimes you couldn't even say, tell what language she was singing in. Well, who gives a damn? I mean, seriously, that does not mean, you see, because this is the implication that if their diction is not superb, then they don't know what they're singing about, that they don't understand what they're singing about that there's some indefinable substance of meaning that they're missing. Well, none of that's true. That's, that's absolute nonsense. Addiction is, is a tricky, tricky thing, especially for singers. I mean, there's some singers who simply can't form certain, certain consonants or achieve certain rhythmic glottal effects while they're singing. But they have gorgeous voices and they're wonderful artists and they're emotional and expressive and passionate and, and all of those things. It is wonderful when a singer has great diction. Maria Callas had fabulous diction. That doesn't mean she pronounced everything in a perfectly idiomatic way, as a native speaker would do it. But wow, could she spit out the syllables. And even the great Joan Sutherland, when she took on Turandot, I'll never forget, you know, the first time I heard her sing Inquesta Regia, boy, her diction is good. 
she says everything. She gets the syllables. I mean, they can do it when they want to or when they need to or when the dramatic situation calls for it. I mean, you have to give artists an opportunity to be themselves. Um, there are moments when diction can be risible, as we say in the biz. You know, when they, their accents are so bad or so wrong that nat native speakers might laugh. It might invite ridicule actual ridicule. And I've heard this, I've heard this on opera recordings, you know, and I've mentioned it in reviews. I've mentioned the fact that the diction is going to be off-putting for native speakers of the language in question, because, because it, it's, it's just, it's just wrong. And so it sounds funny. That's our problem. It's not their problem. It's not their job to say things the way it would be said by your personal view of what perfect pronunciation is. Because, because, like I said, everyone is speaking with their own regional accent. There is no one view of these things. The biggest problem, I think, from the, the, the diction dodos usually concerns French. Probably because French are notorious snobs about everything, <laughs> not least their language. Um, and, and people who speak French or who've bothered to try to speak French, um, you know, feel that they've spent a great deal of time, try, time trying to master correct pronunciation. I mean, I speak French. I studied French. My mother, when we were little, spoke French to us so we would know another language and Hebrew and a few other things besides. So, so you know, we always you know, sort of had a sense of that. And the funniest thing about it is that, is that French singing is a world unto itself. The rules for pronunciation of French in sung French are so different from the words of spoken French. I mean, you, 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 you pronounce the final E's in all the words, cigarette, you know, you have to, you have to put all of your consonant vowels, pardon me, forward, because French is a, is a swallowed language, right? Ce sont, sans, 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 one of our favorite sentences in French was ce sont, sans, 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 sans. They are a hundred meaningless sounds. Ce sont, sans, 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 sans. I mean, you know, you try and get the and you can't sing those sounds. You can't because they, they're in the back of the throat. They, they close off your throat. You can't make a forward tone that, that, that emits properly from your mouth. So French vowels and things often be placed forward and the sound is quite different. And everybody does that a little bit differently, even French people. I mean, they really do because it's, 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 it's difficult. It's, it's an approximation of how the spoken language operates. And so, you know, there are things like that going on all the time. And you have to have a little bit of, of, of consideration for the fact that singers, especially today, are expected to be able to sing everything in, the, in, in its native language. I mean, back in the days, Italian singers sang everything Italian. In Italian, when Mahler went to see Strauss's Electra, which he hated, um, he saw it in Italian. It was sung at the Met in Italian. I mean, you know, all these things. German Wagner was done in Italian, and 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 Verdi was done in German. Especially in provincial opera houses, people only sang in their native languages. But nowadays, singers have to have diction coaches for everything, and you're expected to sing in. <laughs> German and French and Italian and English and Finnish and Czech and Russian and Latvian and you know whatever it is you're supposed to do it and so we have to have I think a great deal of of patience and understanding and people who make diction the sine qua non of a great vocal performance understand nothing about singing and even less about music on the music at hand. That's, that's a fact. I mean, it's ridiculous. Next, the, oh gosh, after the diction dodos, the nationalist ninnies. Oh, these people really, really piss me off. The nationalist ninnies. These are the people who assert, um, because maybe they were born in the country in question, that there is a national idiomatic style that, of course, only they know, and that only artists from the certain region in question can effectively um, embody. Now, this is this is nonsensical for a bunch of reasons. First of all, it prejudices uh, great music from non, what you might call major countries. You know, I mean, because you've got the German style, the French school, the 
American school, the British school, whatever it is, it's, it's a school. Um, but you have countries where have great, they have great composers, the Czech Republic, Finland, Norway, you know, Sweden, all the Scandinavians, you know, and, and the New World, I, you know, because you know, the, the New World was always the stepchild of Western culture, uh, South America, North America, including the United States of America. You know, and, and people argue that there are idiomatic schools of performance, which only the people who are trained in those schools really know. Now, again, there are idiomatic schools of performance. There is no question about it. But that doesn't mean that the performances coming out of those schools will always be wonderful. I mean, I just reviewed Semyon Bichkov's miserably dull Dvorak symphonies. Bielhavik did a horrible Dvorak symphony cycle with the Czech Philharmonic. I mean, they can play as boringly as any group in existence when the conductor isn't galvanizing them to give their best work. And quite often, the idiomatic style is is one of laziness. <laughs> it really is. You know, it's just, you know, they know how to do it because that's what they've been doing for a bazillion years. That doesn't mean it's exciting. And it prevents a reimaginative or recreative view sometimes of a work because, well, it's not in that idiomatic style. The worst people that have, I think, I mean, people talk about it all the time in terms of, again, France and French opera, you know, the style's gone, the style of playing's gone. Well, that's true. Certain, certain styles are gone, and they're gone. I mean, we have to deal with it. It doesn't mean the music can't be played. <laughs> it doesn't mean there can't be great performances along different lines. Those styles no longer exist, and we have to simply accept that fact or enjoy recordings where we can hear what that style was when it did exist. It's not necessarily better. It's just different. But the worst group, for my mind, has always been the British. Yes, the good old xenophobic, British critics, critical military, industri military industrial complex. I am not talking about British listeners and British audiences who I find to be pretty marvelous. I mean, I have a lot of friends there and, and, and I understand they're as open as anybody to wonderful music. But the critical establishment, oh my goodness. I, they have been the worst thing that ever happened to British music. Why? Because any, anyone who really cares and loves the music of their native land if they're really nationalistic or patriotic, at least. You know, we always said patriotism is love of country. Nationalism is hatred of every other one. But, you know, if they really cared, they would be wanting foreign people all the time playing their music in, in foreign lands. You know, they, their music should be the ambassador of their culture, and they should be supporting those efforts, but they don't. They don't because they know how it ought to be done, and how it ought to be done is the way the folks that they know or their buddies, as often as not, and we'll get to more of that in a minute, um, the way they do it. And it is, it, is, it is bad for the music, it is bad for their culture, and it's bad criticism. Because, of course, their minds are completely closed to the possibility of alternate, alternate interpretations. One of the things that I always thought, thought was really fun was people who scream about idiomatic interpretation of George Gershwin, to take an American example. Americans are likely to say, well, there's the American style of jazz and blues, and you know, they don't play Gershwin. Well, some of the best Gershwin performances I've ever heard have been Russian on Melodia. <laughs> I mean, the Russians have always gotten Gershwin. Look at Kapustin and his jazz-influenced works. For some reason, even though the Communist Party hated it, and maybe because the Communist Party hated it, um, Russians have always been really good when it came to jazz stuff. Um, and Gershwin was one of those composers. They, they, they love him, and they play him extremely well. Uh, whether they're still doing it these days, I don't know. But they did, historically, and it has nothing to do with growing up in the style. You could argue just as persuasively, if you really want to take that argument to its extreme, that Gershwin being an Eastern European Jew <laughs> or descended of Eastern European Jews was actually Russian or Slavic. So, I mean, I mean, American popular music was an amalgamation of African American influences, jazz and blues, and Eastern European Jewish influences. So, you know, if you really, really want to hit that argument and take it to its absurd extreme, you could do that. I mean, you could go back to, you know, you know, the, the previous Ice Age and say that, well, the Neanderthals, you know, well, they did all of that first. I mean, you know, so look, it's 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 a bad thing to hang your hat on. 
again, as, a, the, as the sole criterion or the single most important criterion by which you judge a performance. You can talk about national schools, you can talk about idiomatic style, and you should, and you should know what that is if you're a critic. And you should know how these pieces are played in, the, in, their, in their countries or places of origin. But you can't make too much of it. You can't. Take what winds up being just foolish. Next, oh, the score suckers. Oh, the score suckers. This is this comes into the uh, category of a little knowledge is a dangerous thing because all of us, I mean, and I had this period, I went through a score period. We all go through a score period, if you're a critic anyway, when you start reading scores and, and looking at what the composer wanted versus what the performers do. And then you get you get very, very sanctimonious about it, very morally, you know, outraged that these people dare to do something different from what is written, come scritto. And you say, well, Toscanini always followed the score and Fort Fengler just didn't, so he sucks. Well, I mean, Fort Fengler sucks for many reasons, but that's not one of them because Toscanini was just as casual <laughs> when it came to what the score says as Fort Fengler was, sometimes even more so. So I, 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 you, in order to be smart about how you handle a score, when you have it, you have to choose your battles. In other words, in other words, you, you first you have to allow interpreters to interpret, because we know that every single person who wrote a piece of music expected that to happen. Even Stravinsky, who insisted it should just be played exactly as written. Well, then the question becomes, what does exactly as written mean? What does that mean? What is the score in the wider sense that is beyond the printed page, the context in which it was written, the performance traditions that the composers expected, the history of revision and correction that the composer might have gone through in arriving at a final text, the, the, the composer's attitude toward what other performers did. I mean, all of those things are part of what we call score not just the printed page. So you cannot take the printed page and say, well, it's the, it's the ultimate guide. It is very useful in two circumstances. The first of those is when the performers are doing things that are so regularly contradictory to what plainly seems to be the intent of the composer that it makes sense to point it out. There's nothing wrong with doing that because you see that that they're completely off base and then out in another universe. And, you know, that's one thing. That's one thing where it's helpful to mention the score. And the other place it's useful to mention the score is to favorably contrast what the performers do to what the composer writes in, in two ways. One is, well, this artist is actually only doing what the composer wrote, but no one has done it before by taking the composer at their word. You, they've achieved magical results or just the opposite. They're doing something the composer could never have imagined, but the result is revelatory for whatever reason. And you have to select your moments. They have to be moments in the work that matter expressively, that make a certain point, rather than just going, well, in measure 56, the, uh, the E-flat clarinet is missing which is actually a point worth making when you're talking about Carrion's first recording of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, where the E-flat clarinet gets lost in the Rondo burlesque and everyone has to slow down and catch up, which they do, and they left it in the recording. They didn't change it because maybe Carrion felt it wasn't important enough or he didn't notice. Things like that you can point out. They're fun to point out in passing, but you don't judge an entire performance based on it. And I've seen that all the time, and I've seen it in the comments section too. It, it, the, these score suckers tend to elevate trivial detail to ridiculous importance. The the extra timpani at the end of the of the first movement of Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony, dun 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 bum 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 thwomp. You know, it's it's written for the basses alone. There's no timpani there. Lots of people add timpani, possibly with Rachmaninoff's sanction, because Eugene Ormond did it, so who knows? But uh, you know, or or not. But I've seen people say, "Well, I can't listen to that performance. It uses the timpani at the end of the first movement." Well, you know, there are only another hundred and seventy-eight trillion three hundred sixty-eight billion four hundred eighty-five million nine hundred seventy-two thousand one hundred and three notes in the piece all of which are as important <laughs> if, you're going to, if you're going to reduce it to that level of detail, right? 
So, so you, you can't be stupid about little textural amendations. The Schumann symphonies, of course, are full of that kind of stuff because Schumann couldn't orchestrate. And everybody adjusts the orchestration a little bit, whether by changing the actual parts or by altering balances and dynamics. That's what interpreters do. Again, you have to allow the interpreter the opportunity to make their best case and then decide whether or not they've done it. That's, that's what we do. That's what makes a successful performance from either the listener's or the critic's point of view. And last but not least, the old boy blowhards. Oh, these are the gas bags of the critical world. And again, I, I sort of hinted at the <laughs> British critics um, because they sort of do it more than anybody else. These are people who claim to have special knowledge of the circumstances of the performing, of the performance at hand, which quite conveniently, um, you know, relieves them of the obligation to actually listen to it and talk about it intelligently. Oh, well, I was at the recording sessions and, and, and Sir John was getting along so well with the orchestra and everybody had a marvelous time and then they all went out and had a drink and oh, it was just terrific. Or, or, or you know, they, they know the record labels or they know the people behind. They, you get this sense that they have credibility not because they're talking about the music, performance, the details of the performance, the factual details of the interpretation, but rather because they have inside knowledge. But that inside knowledge necessarily, by definition, has nothing to do with the performances. You know, or I saw a live performance of this that was fabulous. Here's the recording. Well, yeah, okay, wonderful. But does the recording suck? Is it the same performance? Is it as good as the live one? No one is there to, to support whether or not um, that your your recollection of what you saw live has any bearing on what you're going to hear on the recording. I mean, these these the the old boy network of critics and 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 people who know the performers and know the things going on. It's it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's unethical. It, it it it's it's the 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 opposite of what a critic is supposed to be doing. And it's supposed to be, I mean, I've had opportunities to talk to artists. I mean, you know, you've seen that I've spoken to, you know, on this channel, I've invited Leonard Slatkin to contribute and things like that, you know, for things that we've done. And, and I'm very, 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 <laughs> well, I'm ambivalent about it. I love talking to these people because they're brilliant musicians and they have wonderful musical insights. And I, I should only be so lucky as to know a fraction of what they've known. Um, fortunately, uh, you know, conductors like Slatkin have written several books about their profession and their life and their career. So you can read it. You can get it that way without having to have firsthand, uh, you know, acquaintance. Um, but I've done my best as a critic to not meet people, um, especially people in the arts. I mean, with any with any level of regularity. I mean, there's the occasional cordial exchange or maybe you'll have lunch with someone once in a while. It's okay. But as long as you're called upon to judge their work, you have to have a certain level of detachment so that you can, have, you can maintain a certain objectivity, a certain distance. Not objectivity in terms of your ultimate evaluation. That's, of course, that's subjective. But objectivity in terms of your openness and lack of bias or prejudice going into the, the listening experience to begin with. Uh, and that's, it's, it's critically important. And so when I, I read these reviews by people who talk about how, how, you know, how strong their connections are, I automatically treat them with great suspicion because who are they writing for? Are they writing for us, the audience, or are they writing for their circle of friends? I think that's a very, very difficult thing to determine sometimes, and it shouldn't be difficult. It should be perfectly clear. Anyway, those are five critical affectations that I see pretty regularly popping up in the review literature. And they're things that I think you should keep in mind as you listen to critics, as you listen to criticism and reviews, and, and evaluate the extent to which the review in question is trustworthy based on, on, on how, much, how much of this bullshit, frankly, um, becomes, becomes a significant factor. So there you have it, my friends. I hope you found this useful. Keep on listening and thanks for joining me. Take care.